Peace, family. John C., a.k.a. You Karima, great man of God media, right back at you again with another GMOG Media Spotlight. Well, family, got another great, heavy topic to talk about. Um, this time, I'm going to be dealing with sports, and I'm going to talk about my favorite sport, boxing. Um, been a huge, huge boxing fan for a very long time. I follow the sport very closely. Um, you know, I, I keep up with all kinds of stories and, and backstories, and stuff leading up to the fights, things of that nature. Uh, you can ask my wife. I'm on boxing blogs and stuff like that all the time. Shout out to, to, to Dante's Boxing Nation, Boxing Eagle, Fight Hype, just to name a few. So I, I keep up with all kinds of things in, in boxing. So what I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to talk about um, basically why black boxers are $40 million slaves. I'm going to talk about racism and I'm going to talk about no matter how much money you make in the sport, you are still under the system of racism, right supremacy. I'm going to break all this stuff down and I'm going to talk about, you know, stuff back then and tie it into what's going on today. All right, family. So I'm going to start it off why I chose a topic. Why black boxers are considered are still 40 million dollar slaves. Well, for one, you know, the, if you're not familiar with the book by uh, William C. Rhodes, get the book 40 million dollar slaves. Powerful book. Everybody should read it. Of, of You know, any athlete, any uh, melanated athlete or expiring athlete read that book get educated uh for those who are not familiar with the book i'm going to play a little short clip so you can understand where i'm coming from all right here it is got a great topic for discussion today in fact it's so great that three and out's gonna have to wait let's get right to it a brand new book comparing rich black athletes to slaves has gotten people talking all over the country There was a time when 40 acres and a mule was the price black slaves sought as restitution for their forced servitude at the hands of white masters. But today, for the superior black athlete, that payment has swelled into millions of dollars, although the money comes without the important commodity of power. And the black slave white owner mentality has remained intact. That is the argument at the core of William C. Rodin's critically acclaimed new book, $40 million slaves, which postulates that not only is the ultra-rich black athlete still a slave beholden to white ownership, but that many of these slaves have willingly remained on the plantation. Joining me right now to talk about the book is the author, William C. Roden, who's been a sports columnist at the New York Times for more than two decades, and Armstrong Williams, the host of the television show, The Right Side, and a guest columnist for USA Today. Also, Dr. Leonard Moore, the author of seven books on race, including African-American racial identity in sports, and an associate professor of history and African-American studies at Louisiana State University, and Joel Mowbray an award-winning investigative journalist and a syndicated columnist. Please give my panel a round of applause, everybody. <laughs> now, now, appreciate you being on the show, uh, Mr. William C. Roden. Had to go to you first. I've known you for years, and I have to say, I, I cannot believe the, the title. I was stunned. $40 million slaves. I mean, talk about that, that title. Where did that title come well, from? That's, that, that's a great starting point. That's great. The title actually comes from Larry Johnson. Mm -hmm. You know Larry Johnson. Yes, I brother, do. Formerly of the New York Knicks. Well, remember in 1999 when the Knicks were in the NBA championship mm -hmm. and Larry was boycotting the media. Mm -hmm. And they were fine, fine, fine. So fine. I said, okay, you all want me to talk? I'm going to talk. Mm -hmm. So he commenced to blast the media and all that. But one of the things he said is that the only people I care about are those brothers on the court. He pointed to the Knicks. He mm -hmm. said, we're rebellious slaves. We're a bunch of rebellious slaves. So, of course, the next day he was just completely massacred Absolutely. in the media. Well, a year later, they were playing a game, Knicks were playing a game in um, uh, Los Angeles yeah. against the Clippers. Against the Clippers, yes. Against the Clippers. And so uh, during the timeout, as they walked to the, uh, to the bench, this white fan stood up behind the Knicks bench, and he said, Johnson, you're nothing but a $40 million slave. Mm. 
And I thought that the uh, anecdote was interesting for two reasons. A, that this fan remembered that for a whole season, and B, that Larry Johnson chose that particular metaphor to, tell, to, to try to describe to the media exactly how he felt. Mm -hmm. You know, that particular myth. So that was, I want that to begin the beginning of a dialogue. Which, and that dialogue is what? Because then you started, a, you, I mean, you started something here. You know that. Well, you know that, Bill. I've known you for years, and I'm telling you right now, I was shocked by the type, because I'm saying to myself, people say, you're talking about slaves and mentioning it in the same breath as million yeah, dollar, multi-million dollar this, athletes. But this is a problem. See, okay. this is the first problem. You cannot equate, see, this, as soon as you begin to equate money with with slavery, you're wrong. I mean, you're wrong because it's, it's a condition. There were brothers, and I went all the way on the plantation. Mm -hmm. I went, I studied, I went, I've been doing it for eight years. I went all the way on the plantation. There were brothers, there were slaves, there were jockeys who were making lots of money. Mm -hmm. Slave jockeys. There was a brother named Charles 1700s Stewart. 1700s and 1800s? Oh, man, seven, there was a brother named Charles Stewart who was a trainer. We're talking about 1810. This brother was a trainer. He had his owners, he, he was in charge of his owner's stables. At a time when black people weren't supposed to leave state without a path, this guy had his run. Of, and you know what? He was making so much money, he had to hire an agent because mm -hmm. he was making so much money. But guess what? Charles Stewart was a slave. He was sold three or four times. Only difference is he could negotiate the terms of his. So but, the, but, but getting back to your point, you're saying money shouldn't be associated with slavery. Money, is that what money, you're saying? Money, money has nothing to do with the condition. Okay. It, the, the, it's the condition of slavery, All not right. necessarily how much money. You All right. So, yeah, that, that was a perfect segue. So he mentioned slavery. He mentioned slavery in the early 1800s, antebellum slavery, you know, um, where slavery was definitely forced. It was it was a uh, it was a it was a law in the so-called United States where slavery was legal. So perfect segue, because I want to talk about the history of racism, a.k.a. white supremacy in boxing. This goes back all the way to the days of. Before it was called boxing, it was called prize fighting, a.k.a. bare knuckle boxing or bare knuckle fighting. All right. And this has been around since the 1600s. But in uh, recorded history. All right. We have some melanated slaves. OK. That entered into the sport of prize fighting, bare knuckle boxing. All right. One of the guys who was a uh, free so-called slave back in the early 1700s his name was bill richmond okay um he was a freed slave a so-called free slave that went to england all right he went to england to start a, a, a kind of a new life and uh he took up some jobs and also was advised by one of his white supremacist superiors to take up boxing um, he got very good at, at boxing, became basically a, a well-known figure in England at that time in the 1700s, the mid 1700s. Um, got so good that he got into a title fight with the best boxer at that time by the name of Tom Cribbs. You know, Tom Cribbs was a very good uh, bare knuckle boxer. Um, and, and, and just another backstory, bare knuckle boxing is the original MMA. All right. Back then, there were no rules. So you could basically not only you can punch, you can kick, throw people, choke, all that stuff. All those rules that you see in MMA today were allowed in bare knuckle boxing. Not only that, there was no time limit and you can basically fight infinitely. Um, the, the longest recorded bare knuckle boxing match was six hours. All right. And the guy quit after the 17th round. Look at it. Look this up, man. I mean, six fighting somebody for six hours straight. That's that's unheard of. So anyway, um, Bill Richmond was a, a very good boxer who got a chance to fight for the the British uh, title, um, and he fought Tom Cribbs. Uh, unfortunately, he lost that fight to Tom Cribbs. Um, after which, he took another uh, so-called free slave at that time and took him under his tutelage and trained him, a guy by the name of Tom Tom Molino. AKA the Moor. He was known, that was his nickname, the Moor, which means obviously means black. All right. Tom Mol Molinar was, a, was also a great, great boxer, bell knuckle boxer who uh, made a name for himself as well. And uh, Bill Richmond trained him, got up, got him a title shot also to fight 
the guy he lost to, Tom Cribs. All right, so he got his title shot in 1810 to fight Tom Cribs. So Tom Cribs and Tom Molinaw faced off in a title match. All right, this took place in uh, England back in 1810. This was an historical great fight at that time. It was basically, uh, if there was pay-per-view back in the 1800s, that would be a pay-per-view fight, all right? Probably would have been a million buys <laughs> back in that time. But anyway, they had a, a, a great fight. It lasted for 39 rounds. Um, and in the 35th round, Tom Cribs basically got knocked down by Tom Molino. Okay. Now, during that time, Tom Molino, he knocked Tom Cribs down, but Tom Cribs corner accused Tom Molino of cheating by saying his gloves was filled with a foreign object or made his gloves heavier or his hands heavier rather because they didn't have gloves at the time, but he made there was a foreign object in his hands, in his knuckles, to, to make his hands heavy, okay? And it, once the his, his corner accused him of that, Tom Molinov turned around and said, hey, I don't have nothing, nothing in my hands. I'm fighting fair and square. I knocked him down fair and square, okay? That was the round where Tom Molinov could have won the, the, the title. The British title at the time could have been the first so-called free slave melanated African descent ancestor to win a title in history in bare knuckle boxing. Okay. So basically the white supremacists accused Tom Molinoff of cheating and he wasn't cheating. All right. So after he turned around and said, Hey, I'm not cheating. The rest is history. He lost that title shot and never got a chance to rematch or anything like that again. So that goes to tell you that, you know, the racism way back when in 1810, the white supremacists will not let you get away with any kind of leverage as long as they can control what you're doing. And as you can see, the racism was so overt back then that anything you tried to do as far as any leverage to you succeeding in their system they're going to pull that back and say, hey, no, not so fast. Uh, you got to do this, this and that or is a no go. All right. So, like I said, you know, racism in, in sports and in, in specifically boxing, I'm talking about boxing this time. And this particular topic goes back in the 1700s, in the early 1700s to 1800s. All right. During antebellum slavery. All right. So. Fast forward to 2015, all right? And obviously, you know, that's a big leap because obviously there's, there's so many different stories I could talk about. I could be talking about this for hours or days rather for all the different, you know, white supremacist uh, antics and, and things of that nature that has been done in the sport of boxing to people of color, particularly African-American. But I'm not gonna do that. I'm just gonna fast forward to today in 2015. Of what's going on today so what you got going on today family in, in in boxing you got the most lucrative fighter ever just retired by the name of floyd mayweather jr all right just fought manny pacquiao did record-breaking numbers made over 400 million dollars uh oh and when it's all said and done with pay-per-view costs um all of you know all of the uh the gate money uh, it was around four hundred million dollars he made. You know, lucrative fight, record-breaking numbers. Then he fought Andre Berto. Um, you know, he did five hundred thousand buys. People thought that was a flop, but compared to Triple G, Triple G, who they try to boost up as a pay-per-view star, and I'm going to talk about him later. Uh, I would consider that a success. So anyway, you have Floyd Mayweather who just retired. You know, uh, the most lucrative athlete out there, the most lucrative boxer of all time. And he is being trashed and he's been, been he's been being trashed in the media for quite some time, but specifically today because he's retired and people are coming out of the woodworks to discredit this man's legacy and history in boxing because it's well cemented. He's a Hall of Famer when it's all said and done. 
and this man's record and this man's legacy would never be duplicated but you know the, the people won't, the white supremacists won't acknowledge that at all not whatsoever so the question is well Floyd Mayweather made, made all this money you know he's been the most lucrative fighter and the most lucrative athlete you know in today in sports how can this man be you know in a system of racism how can this man you know be in a system of, of racism what you call white supremacy well it's very simple I'm gonna break it down to the early days of Floyd Mayweather's career when he was known as Floyd pretty boy Floyd Mayweather all right this is before he took on the bad bad guy persona of Floyd money Mayweather all right so before the Floyd money Mayweather there was the pretty boy Floyd Mayweather this guy was basically portrayed to be a good guy could portrayed to be you know a, a, an all-american fighter obviously he had he was very talented but didn't get a lot of recognition because of his image being portrayed as you know just a good guy someone who just says all the right things and things of that nature and also you know he wasn't outspoken at that time when he was known as pretty boy floyd it gradually built up you can see uh, the transformation from pretty boy floyd to money mayweather during the time he was fighting guys like arturo gotti and then from that point he got the fight with oscar de la hoya now from oscar de la hoya after he fought him at that time they broke pay-per-view numbers it was the highest generated fight pay-per-view wise and gate wise of all time it wasn't broken until actually wasn't broken until this recent this year with uh manny pacquiao and floyd mayweather but after the fight with oscar de la hoya that's when the floyd money mayweather persona was born and after he fought oscar de la hoya he fought ricky hatton okay and uh from there it's been money mayweather the outspoken the arrogant the cocky guy that the white supremacists love to hate they hate literally hate this guy so much so that in a, in a poll from last year there was a poll that basically had the a hunt the hundred most hated athletes of all time and Floyd Mayweather was ranked 28th as the most hated athlete of all time. All right, the white supremacists hate this man because of what he's what he done for the sport, and his record is unblemished. And obviously, he's so-called retired, but once he gets back in the ring, and I know he will, he's gonna be 50 and 0, no matter who who's his opponent is. But he was able to do it his way, even under the system of racism white supremacy all right so the money persona was born and as you can see when you have boxing and your clientele 90 percent of your clientele are white people okay your clientele they're paying to watch you lose okay and this is i'm going to tie this into going back into slavery all right there's a book called 100 Years of Lynching. All right. And they talk about how, you know, slaves and black people were getting lynched, but it was being set up like an event. So spectators, white supremacists will come out to see black people get killed, legalized lynchings. And people will spectate and crowd around to see black people getting lynched publicly. And it was a spectacle. So it's the same thing with boxing. White people will pay to see a black man lose. They'll pay top dollar just to see him lose. So at the end of the day, in Floyd's eyes, it's like, hey, money is money. No matter if it's from people who hate me or love me, money is money. But guess what? Your consumers, your the consumers are the dominant society. They are the white people who are paying your salary for you to get that kind of you know high gross checks 
uh, record number gates, things of that nature. They are paying to see you lose. Okay, because you built yourself up with that particular image, that bad boy image that people love to hate. Okay, you're cocky, you're arrogant, you show money, you, you have, you know, anything pops that you can you can imagine you can get based off the money that you make in boxing. That that's cool. You know, and I definitely commend Floyd May Mayweather for that. But at the end of the day, you know, his clientele, the consumers who are watching him fight are whites okay they're the dominant consumers the dominant society all right and they are paying top dollar they were able to continue to pay top dollar to see him lose and that's that's the truth you know I only, like i said on my channel i only deal with truth and logic i deal with facts and logic that's it i don't deal with emotions so i'm just going to give you just the blood raw truth of what's going on and how this ties up with with black people melanated people and how we can overcome the system of racism, white supremacy with the system of justice. OK, now, again, I'm talking about sports in this particular topic, and this falls under the nine areas of activity, which is entertainment. Entertainment is the category that's above sports. OK, so sports is entertainment. They're, they're synonymous. But anyhow, so, yeah, Floyd Mayweather's consumers are white. All right. Now, I'm going to tie this in also with Al Heyman. For those who don't know who Al Heyman is, he is the um, manager slash advisor of not only Floyd Mayweather, but a plethora of other boxers, talented boxers. And so much so, he was able to create his own brand called PBC Premier Boxing Champions, where he took it back to the 1980s, where you had great boxing on free TV and you get that today. So he was able to put his particular network, his brand, Premier Boxing Champions on free TV and give you some great, great fights. All right. Some great fights. Even the so-called subpar fights. I would rather watch a subpar fight on free TV than subscription based HBO or Showtime any day. And not only that, he's keeping uh, with all these fights that are constantly on free TV, damn near every week, you are keeping black people employed as far as people in the media, you know, um, things of that nature. Uh, any aspect in the nine areas of activity, he's able to keep black people in work, keep them working, which is what you want to do. But again, this goes back to the system of racism, and white supremacy. So when you have a man that's able to do record breaking numbers, which is Al Heyman, just like Floyd Mayweather, guess what? The white supremacists say, nah, I, I, I don't think so. You're going to have to do something for us to get a piece of what you're doing or we're shutting everything down. All right. So lo and behold, PBC is doing record breaking numbers. Now you got people like Bob Arum, Oscar De La Hoya suing Al Heyman. OK. Top rank, which is owned by Bob Arum, is suing Al Heyman. Now, actually, earlier this year, he sued Al Heyman, but the case was dismissed. Bob Arum refiled the case and is trying to pursue litigation and monetary return for hundreds of millions of dollars. All right, I'm not, I'm not gonna get into the details of the case, but that's the gist of it. Basically, the white supremacists are saying, you are making too much money. I'm gonna stop what you're doing because you're not gonna take over boxing. We're gonna, I'm gonna do whatever I can to stop what you're doing because I see you're successful. Let me see, if, if let me tell you something. If PBC failed, or it was just basically mediocre. Nobody cared about it. Think Bob Air is going to sue Al Heyman? Absolutely not. Same thing with Oscar De La Hoya. He's uh, he's suing Bob. Well, he's suing, excuse me, uh, Al Heyman as well. And you know, so the, the the list goes on. And you know, Oscar De La Hoya. Yes, he's a white supremacist. He's categorized as white Hispanic. So yes, he falls under the system or being in the system of a white supremacist. So much so that Oscar De La Hoya today, or most recently, 
decided to write an article by tarnishing the legacy of Floyd Mayweather. Basically saying that Floyd Mayweather wasn't fighting the competition that he wanted to fight. Um, and his fighting style was boring. He didn't have enough knockouts, things of that nature. Just basically dismissing the legacy of Floyd Mayweather. It was very, very dis disgusting, disturbing. And in the top of it all off, he said that boxing is better off without Floyd Mayweather. Okay, so he took it beyond keeping in business. It was all personal, personal attacks based off things that he wanted his personal feelings was involved in that particular article now i have everything in the link i have everything in the description that you can click on the links for but like i said you know the way that racism white supremacy works when black people are succeeding in one of the areas of activity they're going to do whatever they can to take over what you're trying to do okay now you can say hey uh brother chauncey you know, we got, uh, you know, we have a black owner and Michael Jordan owns a black franchise. Well, guess what? Who made that? Who made that brother rich? Who made Michael Jordan rich? The consumer. But who got him to that position? Phil Knight. All right. You want to talk about Michael Jordan? No. Michael Jordan is powerless without Phil Knight, who is the founder of, of Nike. That's just straight up. Phil Knight is the most powerful man in Nike. So he can do whatever he wants to do in terms of Jordan brand and all that kind of stuff. If it wasn't for Phil Knight, there would be no Jordan brand shoes, a multi-billion multi -billion dollar corporation of shoes that people get shot over for sneakers. All right, so just miss me with that. All right, so moving on. so. Talked about Al Heyman, talked about Floyd Mayweather. Now, people are talking about, since Floyd Mayweather has retired, who is the next superstar in boxing? Who is the media trying to coddle and basically portray as the next superstar in boxing? Because let's also not get this twisted. There's a difference between superstar and pound for pound. All right, so pound for pound list is up for debate. You can say Andre Ward. You can say Guillermo Ricandial. You know, you you can say um, Terrence Crawford. But as far as a superstar, who is the media trying to portray as the next superstar? Well, you guessed it, Triple G, Gennady Golovkin. Now, People are actually saying Gennady Golovkin is a pound for pound fighter. He's not even in the top 10 in my opinion. I mean, the facts are facts. He fought David Lemieux, knocked him, knocked him out, but his record says otherwise. So he's nowhere near a top pound for pound fighter at all. You know, let's not get it twisted. Now there was an article recently that Floyd Mayweather actually had to say interview that Floyd May Mayweather said that the media wants Triple G to be the next superstar because he's white okay and it's very true but it's not only because it's white it's because also his fighting style and you know the cliche styles make fights well Gennady Golovkin's style is aesthetically pleasing to the casual fan so you he has a mixture of, of a few things because his European ancestry that's number one he's white okay and number two his fighting style is aesthetically pleasing to the casual fan. So he puts on performances where he'll knock somebody out. Now his level of competition has been, truth be told, just garbage tomato can fighters. With, I would say, his last opponent, David Lemieux, is a mediocre opponent as well. Um, but he needs to step up his level of competition. But no matter who he fights, he's he's more than likely going to knock that person out and people like to see knockouts that's what people want to pay to see is knockouts something that says his style of fighting is aesthetically pleasing to the eye as well now when he fought david lemieux he preached before the fight he preached mexican style 
But during that fight, he actually boxed. He methodically boxed. He showed movement. You know, he showed lateral movement. He was able to he established his jab. He established his range, things of that nature. Um, so he did more boxing than he did any, any kind of brawling or looking for a surprise knockout, even though he did get the knockout. But it was more, he was a more methodical approach to his last fight with David Lemieux. All right, so yes, they're trying to push a white superstar, a European superstar by the name of Gennady Golovkin as the next boxing superstar. And speaking of superstars, also recently on the cover of Ring Magazine for the first time ever, you had an MMA fighter, a female MMA fighter on the cover of Ring Magazine by the name of Ronda Rousey. All right, now, Ronda Rousey is being hyped up by the media, obviously, the, the white controlled media, you know, as the next sensation well, she's already she's already out there right now. She's pretty much the most relevant fighter in MMA today, um, Ronda Rousey. But uh, she's on the cover of Ring Magazine because simple. She's white and she's popular. All right. And she's happened to beat everybody, um, even though the competition within her sport in MMA is pretty much mediocre at best. Uh, the only fighter out there that you know that people want to see is is uh, Cyborg. You know that people want to see her fight Cyborg, but unfortunately, you have some differences in weight. So hopefully, we'll see that fight in the near future, and they can work that out, and come out you know with a catch weight or something like that. But that's the only fight people want to see is is her fighting Cyborg and getting that done. But yes, Ronda Rousey is on the cover of Ring Magazine. All right, now. Again, she's on the cover of Reading Magazine because it's simple. She's white and she's popular. But there is a boxer out there, a female boxer out there, who a lot of people don't even know even exist uh, by the name of Cecilia Bracus. Now, Cecilia Bracus is a fighter, a female fighter, boxer, who is 27 and 0 with 7 KOs. She happens to be the WBA, WBO, WBC, and IBF female welterweight champion. So they had the Ring Magazine had an opportunity to put this, put this female undefeated boxer on the cover, but they chose Ronda Rousey from a different sport with less experience. But because she's white and she's popular, she's on the cover. Now, going back to, uh, to Cecilia Bracus, Cecilia Bracus, uh, and, and you can look her up right now. She she's actually uh, her heritage is from Colombia, but she resides in Norway. So she has a little bit. She has a little bit of European ancestry, but she also has some African ancestry as well. So if you look at her picture online, she has some Africoid features. So to me, she looks black. To me, she looks. She to me, she looks like a melanated female. Okay, um, and that's another reason why it's just that simple. You have you live in a system of white supremacy, so they can pick and choose who they want as the next superstar. Okay, and when you want to be popular, especially black uh, boxers, when you want to be popular, when you want to be considered a household name you got to do things out of your character floyd mayweather had to be had to do that persona of floyd money mayweather and play the villain and be outspoken and do ignorant stuff to gain more exposure so that he be he can be a household name but even before that you had mike tyson mike tyson was not only a, a, a guy who was had a fighting style that was aesthetically pleasing to the eye of the casual fan because he put on great performances but was also knocking everybody out. He was also very outspoken and was doing some crazy and saying some crazy things that people would actually gravitate to. So Mike Tyson was just, you know, out there with his interviews and casual fans, people all over the world would just gravitate to what he's what he's saying and what he's doing because they want to know exactly 
what this guy's thinking okay so a part of that was not it's not really an act for him that was more natural but i blame that on the actual environment that mike tyson was in you know you had an environment that was you know basically riddled with segregation racism things of that nature uh so it's all it's, part of it is also part of his upbringing as well but that's a whole nother topic of conversation but the point being is that when a black boxer wants to elevate his popularity they have to do things that are considered unnatural all right um going back to the heavyweight division i talked about vladimir Krishko. um there's an american heavyweight boxer right now deontay wilder who has the highest knockout percentage in boxing today people are talking about triple g but no it's actually deontay wilder but deontay wilder is not a household name right now simply because not only is a black fighter but he's not doing anything outlandish or saying anything outlandish to get to that next level now he can choose to to gain more popularity so if he decides to put a video up on youtube and him flushing money down the toilet a la adrian broner i'm pretty sure he would gain more exposure but right now he chooses not to do that you know he's seen when he's doing his interviews he is a well-spoken guy a funny guy but doesn't do anything outlandish you know to draw the kind of attention to a casual fan so you know until deontay water does that he's basically going to be uh just a good boxer but not a household name type of boxer that's going to be world renowned okay but he does have the he does have the style to appeal to the casual fan but his personality and the way he talks um during his interviews um right now he he's he's not at that level yet because he's not doing anything outlandish to to take his particular popularity to the next level all right so going back to what i was saying the white boxers why black boxers are 40 million dollar slaves it's quite simple going back to systematic racism which is white supremacy okay we are in that system of racism white supremacy that affects all areas of activity including entertainment which is sports all right family so at the end of the day all right no matter if you are the the highest paid athlete of all time or the most powerful manager slash advisor in boxing today, which is Al Heyman, you are still in the system of racism, white supremacy. All right. Boxing. Well, they say boxing is not a regulated sport. That's true and untrue. All right. It's not regulated by one sanctioning body, but that sanctioning body is still a system which is a system of racism white supremacy all right that's who controls boxing all right so anytime you see like i said before anytime you see a boxer or a promoter slash manager slash advisor doing record-breaking numbers and the white supremacists are not involved they're going to get involved one way or another one way or another where they have to stop what you're doing take money out of your pocket what have you they're gonna do something to change the landscape of what you're trying to do all right and i already ex I already explained and disseminated to you what they're doing to floyd mayweather right now since he's, re since he's retired they're tarnishing this man's name they're trying to tarnish this man's legacy all right same thing with al Heyman. al Heyman is doing record-breaking numbers but at the end of the day the white supremacists shut that down all right as you can see as i said before oscar de la hoya and bob Heron are suing al Heyman and trying to stop what he's doing by providing great boxing matches on free tv i mean i don't see how anybody else can complain the only people that are complaining are those two guys the boxers are complaining the fans are complaining the actual true boxing fans, they aren't complaining at all. You know, they love these fights. I love these fights on free TV, you know, and I want this to continue, you know. But at the end of the day, like I said, family, 
This all goes back to racism, white supremacy. And the only way to resolve the system of racism, white supremacy, is to replace that with a system of justice. All right, now I'm gonna explain what a system of justice again is. Justice is guaranteeing that no person is mistreated and guaranteeing that the person who needs help the most gets the most constructive help. Just that simple family. All right, so I'm gonna leave it at that family. Make sure you like, comment, subscribe. Follow me on Twitter at Ukarima Beats. The link is in the description. Make sure you also follow me on Facebook. My Facebook page is GMOG Media. Make sure you subscribe. GMOG Media TV on YouTube. I'm gonna be checking in every week, dropping in heavy material that's affecting melanated people, people of African descent. All right, and how we can overcome the system of racism, white supremacy with the system of justice. All right, family, Chauncey, AKA Ukarima, GMOG Media, signing out. Peace.